testing. Yeah. So. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Gianni. Uh, thank, thank you, Antonello, for your nice introduction. Uh, I, I'm in a strange position now because um, I feel like this kind of John the, the Baptist figure in the sense that my presentation is going to be the only one where quantum physics is hardly going to enter into it. This, uh, as, as part of, the, of uh, the introduction to quantum computing, the organizer decided that it would be useful for people to, um, considering different, different backgrounds and different uh, stages of uh, um, the different people are at the, in, in their career, it would be interesting to have uh, an introduction from classical computing and figuring out where, um, how come we eventually ended up uh, discussing uh, quantum computing. So for some of you, some of the things that I'm going to talk about are going to be uh, old concepts. Um, hopefully, you won't have seen every single thing that I'm going to present, but this is my contribution to the, to the hackathon. Uh, in preparing the way for the second speaker to discuss uh, uh, quantum uh, um, quantum computation models in more, in, in, in more details. So, uh, without further ado, the, the, the story that I want to tell you is a, is a story with theorems. So this is what, what um, maybe something we, we, we could um, it, uh, this is the way that I, I would like to present. So, uh, story starts in uh, 18th century Königsberg. It's a city at, at the time of in, in Prussia. And uh, one of the um, uh, legend has it that at some point, one of the uh, pastimes of the people was to figuring out whether it was possible to take a stroll through the city crossing each and every one of the seven bridges that straddle the river passing through the town. So this is what Königsberg looked like at the time. That we could call a this um, why do we know these kind of things? Why do we still talk about it? Because this this particular problem, finding a path that crosses all of the bridges in uh, in Königsberg was uh, an example that uh, spurred uh, Leonard Euler to discuss one of, to write one of his most uh, well-known papers. And uh, the problem is that is about what we now would call Eulerian, uh, Eulerian graphs. So the Eulerian graph problem is I give you a graph and I want you to find a cycle that passes through all of the edges, it occupies all of the edges of, of, uh, of your graph. And in general, if you were to uh, try to solve something like this, naively you would think that you would, you would have to do some sort of uh, um, tree search. You start somewhere, you try to 
cross into one of the, of, the, of the edges of one of the bridges, and then you try and figure out, you can follow through and until you get stuck, and then maybe you need to backtrack, and this is the naive approach one would have in solving these kind of problems. But Euler being Euler, figured out that, well, for Königsberg, in this, says in this paper, this might be doable because there's not that many bridges and that, not that many uh, stretches of land, but Venice, by some account, has 121 islands and it's connected by 435 bridges. So that seems to be way less doable than this. So what Leonard Euler figured out is that in, a, in what we now call the an Eulerian path, every time I visit a node, first of all, you, you, obviously you can simplify this into a graph, right? What actually matters here is this structure. This is the same thing, just simplified here. Every time you pass, you, you visit a node, you need, also need to leave it. So if you have an Eulerian path, all the nodes need to have ev an even degree, an even number of edges incident to that, to that uh, 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 to, to, that to, to each particular vertex. And, uh, well, maybe, maybe it's, this is something we can, we can actually prove. So, this is, because what people usually discuss here is that that's a necessary and sufficient condition for being an, an uh, Eulerian graph. But what, what Euler actually proved is only the, the one side of the of the of the of the claim, which means that Eulerian means The fact that people maybe don't, don't particularly know is that this, this other uh, implication here was also proven, not by Euler though, by some other person nobody, nobody remembers. So for, for his benefit, we will we'll, 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 we'll not, we will not discuss this at, at this time, but the main concept here is that now I have a particular property having vertices having all even degrees that allows me to decide whether an Eulerian cycle exists in the graph. This is way simpler to check than the kind of tree search that I was doing at the beginning naively. But without Euler, one would be stuck with using that, that technique there. So contrast it with 1859 when Sir William Rowan Hamilton was the Royal Astronomer of Ireland and a professor of astronomy at the Trinity College Dublin when he decided to start selling a toy called the, the Icosian Game that I'm going to briefly described to you.
You must imagine this wooden board with grooves and with holes here at the vertices that you can put pegs in. You have number pegs. So the idea is now to define a path through this graph here that instead of passing through all of the edges, visited all of the, of the vertices once without crossing multiple edges uh, by doing so. And uh, well, the toy was a commercial failure, so the guy kept his day job. But the, the, the main point here is that even though the problem seems to be very similar to this one, as of today, we don't have an efficient way of solving, of deciding that property, whether or not a graph has a Hamiltonian path. Whereas, whereas in this case, we do have it thanks to Euler. So you might be, you might be uh, disappointed in me saying, well, I would like to see that. Here, OK, it's clear that I have a simple, a simple property to test. There, we just don't know. We just, we just never found such a property. And uh, maybe in, in the following, in the, in the second part of the lecture, maybe we'll come back to this and uh, show more evidence. But at this time, yes, uh, even though a, number, a large number of people have tried to find some equivalent property or equivalent uh, method to, to solve these kind of problems, it seems that, that in the hardness of these two problems are intrinsically different. So it's not a matter of uh, uh, effort. It's, uh, it's something really, it seems to be it's, there's something mathematically, there's a mathematical structure behind this that makes that easy and that hard. And uh, this is one example, let's say, for, it's the first time when we encounter something that is quite common in uh, computational complexity, where um, Proving lower bounds to the hardness of a problem is more complicated than proving upper bounds. Because to prove that something is not, hard, not harder than some x, uh, some x quantification, you just need to exhibit a way that solves the problem in using that, that amount of resources. But proving that a, a problem is hard is harder than something would require you to claim that all the methods available to solve that thing actually use more resources than x. So it, there seems to be an intrinsic hardness, different classes of intrinsic hardness to problems that we, people encounter in, in normal combinatorial uh, problems. So the, the, the next chapter to, to, in order to figure out to, let's say, formalize this, this, uh, this property a bit better is uh, we need to move uh, to the early 20th century in 1928 uh, when David Hilbert posed a question which is now known as the Unscheidung's problem, whether or not there is an effective method which can decide that a formula is a theorem for some axiomatic system. Um, a few years before the completeness theorem was proven that for whatever, if, if you're familiar with it, fine. Otherwise, you must think something like logical, first order logic was uh, proven to be correct and complete, meaning that um, the, the logical calculus David Hilbert had developed uh, was uh, sufficient to prove all and, uh, and only the true statements, the uh, uh, logical truth in, in this particular axiomatic method. But 
This is a generic mathematical statement. The question is, is there a way for me, if I tell you, if I give you a particular formula, whether that's a, the a theorem or not? And one of the problems in answering this kind of question was that there was no real concept of what an effective method would, would be. It was a, there was intuitive uh, proposal, for example, uh, Alonso Church had developed the uh, Lambda Calculus, which is the basis of uh, functional programming languages today. And uh, Kurt Gödel had uh, developed recursive, the, the theory of recursive functions, but they all suffered from uh, a, a basic question of, okay, those functions might be intuitively computable, but why would I believe that those families of functions would be all of the computable functions. And uh, from, from our perspective, the, the solution to this problem was given by uh, Alan Turing in, uh, in a famous paper uh, in, the, in the early part of, of 20th century, where he introduced the concept of a Turing machine, which I briefly des described now. So formally, a Turing machine you can see as a triple of objects. You have sigma, which is an alphabet. You have Q, which is a set, a finite set of states. And you have a transition function. The idea is that the machine would be would be able to access a tape. Each of which divided in squares. Uh, each of the squares could contain one element of the alphabet, a symbol from the alphabet. And uh, at each time, the machine would have a, a pointer or a head. I could see only one of the tape of the squares in the in the tape. And uh, a set of instructions will tell you. Well, if you're seeing a, a particular symbol S and you are in the state Q, then print a symbol S prime, change your state to a new state inside of Q, and then either move to the left, to the right, or stay. One can imagine the tape to be, for example, infinitely long to the, to the right, even though that's, uh, that's kind of decision that you can take. Uh, a configuration for a machine is like, is, uh, should describe
the contents of the tape. So you can assign the positions here, etc. And this should specify the contents of this tape. One of the symbols of the, of the alphabet we take to indicate a blank, meaning it's an empty square. It should specify a state Q, current state. Should specify the position of the head. And this is current. Well. Now, how would uh, um, a machine compute something? Well, given an input, it would, you would have to give it an input, so you would have to specify the content of the first, some n. Here. And uh, the machine would start in an initial configuration where meaning that, as I said, the first few squares contain the, the symbols of the input. And uh, the, the in initial state should be a specific state we decide to, to be an initial one. And the position of the head starts in the zero position. Now, from an initial, from an initial configuration, we can move to a successive configuration following the instruction given by the transition function. So if this, if uh, some phi u i is a configuration at time t, then uh, the configuration at time t plus one should be given by the following. The tape, away from the position of the, of the head, the tape does not change. And at the position where the head is looking at the moment, then write what the instruction is telling you to write. And as for the, for the rest of the, for the other two elements here, Q prime, to be the second element. And 
and I prime gets updated based on the third element of the instruction. So plus or minus one, depending on whether I'm going to the left or the right, or the same if, if L R if say. So these are these two these two uh, descriptions, these two pieces of information should tell you sh should convince you that if I know the, my initial configuration and I know the recipe for producing successive configuration given a given a previous one then I can define a sequence of configurations that describe the computation of my machine. Um, in particular, we, we, we want, uh, since a configuration, uh, since a computation at the end of the day, it's something where I, need, I want to produce uh, some uh, final uh, result, I will declare some, some of the state to be you accepting or Q rejecting, which is going to be useful later. And uh, with, with the idea that once the machine arrives, in, enters into, the, into an accepting state or a rejecting state, the computation stops. If Q is accepting, I can read the non-blank part of the, of the of the tape as the, the output of the machine on the, that particular uh, input. So in general, we, we can, using this recipe here, we can define uh, computable functions in the sense of these are function, a function from, typically these are partial functions, so they might not be defined on all of the domain, but only on, on a subset. Is the cleaning star is the set of all finite strings of elements that I can build on using the, my alphabet. So a, a, a function like this is computable if there exists A Turing machine, say M of F, the computation. to the output, let's say, m of x, meaning the output of m on input x should be f of x. Now, this counting from counting arguments, one should immediately figure out that most of these functions here are non-computable. Why? Because, well, because there's, there's, these machines here are finite objects, and uh, I can define specific representations for these machines using simple uh, uh, strings from, uh, from a finite alphabet itself. So the main thing that I want to define here is that I want to describe a machine like that using a finite string or a, over a given alphabet so that in particular I can feed the, the source code of a machine into a different machine. And there's di multiple ways to do this, but uh, the, 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 simple, the si simple ways to do that, one that comes to mind, for example, I could use an alphabet like this. 
parentheses, close parentheses, some bar. Yeah. doing it, but uh, the, the main point is to encode the, the, the transition function here, you should have something. It, you can just use, you can give, uh, let's say, a standard um, uh, enumeration of the states, say, u is going to be u1, un, you give a standard enumeration of your alphabet, S1, SK, and then each single uh, uh, application of, of, the, of the transition functions to a specific arguments, you can see as an instruction saying, you can have, say, for example, uh, let's say that uh, you're trying to write down the instruction saying if, I, uh, if I'm seeing the symbol SA and I'm in the state QB, then write SC, go in the, in the state QD, and then move, uh, move the movement also we can, uh, we can Say one, two, three. And this you can you can use, for example, bars just to like say A bars here means the first symbol, B bars here means the second symbol. The, 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 the B uh, state, sorry. C bars here means um, the C th state, uh, the C th symbol, and the D bars here, the D th state, and finally, I can say that one means uh, going left, two bars means going right, three bars means stay fixed. So a transition function is just a finite number of expressions like this. I can use a separator here but to, to denote that uh, this is the first part, the so symbol, state, symbol, state, movement. And a Turing machine becomes, the description of a Turing machine becomes simply a sequence of expressions like this. There are nicer ways of encoding machines to strings, but it should be uh, a hope uh, clear that you can do something like this, this is easy, and uh, you should know that if you have a finite symbol, uh, a finite set of symbols, then the, fine, uh, the set of fi uh, finite strings um, you can make out of it is countable, whereas the number of uh, the functions there has the cardinality of the continuum. So clearly, you should expect that most of these functions are not computable. But, okay, uh, it would be somewhat harder to come up with, a, with a, an explicit example of, uh, of a, such a, a, such a non-computable function. And uh, yes, this is something that uh, Turing also pr proved in his, uh, his original paper, and that is a well-known example. It's the, it's, the, uh, it's the solution to the halting problem. So let me very quickly go through it.
By this symbol, I mean the representation of the machine M as a string. So this function takes two possible, uh, two um, uh, arguments, and it outputs one if the machine set on input X eventually reaches a state uh, accepting, rejecting, or at any, at any rate, it, it eventually halts, halts. And it's zero if the, if the machine runs forever, either because it's stuck in a loop or just because the instructions are such that they just, they're just never entering these kind of uh, uh, accepting, um, halting states. So the claim is that this function is not Turing computable. It's not computable by any machine. And the proof is well known, but let me uh, quickly review it. Uh, we prove it by contradiction. Assume that such a machine exists. <laughs> then the idea is you want to, to build a new machine, say X, such that on input x, the machine simul first simulates h, h on x, x, so it diagonalizes the input. And then based on the, on the output of these of this, uh, calculations, It's, uh, uh, I'm assuming H exists, which computes this function. This function has two inputs here. So what the, the, the machine X here is, it takes the input, it applies it in the same, uh, in the same argument. So when this, is, when this is the same as this one. And then let it run. This is going to be, uh, um, trying to, to, to see if the machine given by uh, the, the, the string x uh, holds or not on its own string, on its own description. So, and you see that you see that the idea is that this, ca this cannot exist. This, uh, this H cannot exist because if you ask yourself, so what happens if I run if I were to run X, the machine X, on its own description? If you assume that this one stops, then by the definition there, it means that if this stops, then it means That is, by this, it means that it runs forever.
But if I assume that runs forever, then by construction it means that H equals one, which means it, it stops. So this obviously is contradictory, and by contradiction means that this H cannot, cannot exist. So F is non-computable. The halting problem is non-computable. And uh, this is an, uh, um, uh, a proof of that, of that statement. Let me finish here. So what we got here is that after Turing, now we have, what rather, Alan Turing defined this benchmark for uh, what an effective method is that people have accepted and so far, and if you actually if you if, if you go through the literature, you will find that all the previously proposed lambda calculus and recursive functions uh, and the Turing computable functions all identify the same set of functions. So people believe that this is a properly, the, the currently accepted, properly defined uh, algorithm or mechanical effective uh, method and uh, so that so that this is encapsulated in this was encapsulated in the church during thesis any intuitively computable function is Turing computable. This is a thesis, this is not a theorem, this is not a uh, proposition, this is not something you can prove, it's in just a, a consensus on what an intuitive, the intuitive concept of algorithm or effective method, a machine, uh, a method that can be carried out without, without any uh, oiler having to come up with some brilliant idea. It's a completely mechanical, it can be, uh, it's, a, it's the basis of uh, modern day computers that we have. And on top of having the, def the uh, de um, useful definition of, uh, of uh, effective method, now we have also a way of benchmarking the, the hardness of solving problems. Because we can use the runtime of this benchmark machine meaning the number of steps it has to go through before reaching uh, the end of its calculations as, uh, as a measure of the resources needed to solve problems like the Eulerian problem we saw before or the Hamiltonian problem we saw before. So the running time of such a machine, which is intuitively, uh, which I leave it to be in, 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 intuitively uh, meant as the number of, of configuration in the calculations, is now something we can use as a universal benchmark for uh, deciding hardness in, uh, in, in of, of computational problems in general. Let me quickly go through how people have done this so far, and then we accelerate towards less standard material. Through the representation which I, which I said uh, uh, before, you can use, uh, you can, since a machine is basically a set, the set of, in this given, the, the performance of the machine is given by the set of instructions, if I can write down the instructions, and then I, I send it as an input to a, to a different machine, for example. You, you can use this, this second machine to scan the instruction and simulate the other machine. 
So in general, it's the thing of saying something, you can take a program and write it down and feed it to another program. Because a program is just a string that describes uh, some sort of uh, abstract machine that is working in this way, or in some similar equivalent way. And uh, so a machine is, a, I, can, I can consider a machine at the same time as this kind of structure here, or the description of a machine. And by using the description, I can feed a machine, or rather the instructions that describe a machine as well, to a different machine. And through this diagonal, well, uh, it's gone, no, it's, it's here. So this diagonal construction, I eventually get to a contradiction imagining that there's a machine that does this. Clear? What do you mean runs one or zero? May I interrupt you? Maybe I think there's a misunderstanding here in the sense that in the construction, we are assuming that the input is always finite. So you cannot feed an infinite input to the machine. That's by construction. The input is infinite in the sense that it, the tape has blanks uh, all the way to the, to the right. But that's not considered to be part of the input for the machine. The input needs to be finite. And uh, so the, I, I would say the, the, the argument is, is, does not apply here. Sorry. So I see that we're running a bit late, but yes. If you come from computer science, I'm sure you've done your fair share of, uh, of uh, exercise on Turing machines and stuff. They're not like the most uh, exciting things in, in my idea, but. So now we're at the point where finally we have, we have a proposed, um, benchmark that is universal, you can apply uh, to study hardness of problems. So how do people study hardness of problems? Uh, how do you formalize uh, the, the hardness in, in, in this setting using these uh, abstract computational devices? Well, usually what you will encounter is that you will define typically problems in, in, the, in the formalization of hardness are defined as decision problems, meaning the theory of hardness, the most developed theory of hardness, is uh, the kind of hardness of answering yes, no questions, which is definitely not the only questions you have, you want your computer to, to solve. You have all sorts of combinatorial uh, uh, problems you want to find, you want to minimize costs uh, and all sorts of things, but the most developed theory of uh, hardness is for, for yes, no questions. So typically this is defined by giving the concept of language or decision problem.
I have an alphabet. Again, there's the set of all, uh, of all finite strings. A language is a subset of these strings. And the strings that belong to the language, uh, we say, uh, get an, an answer, uh, answer yes to the problem. And uh, the, the, the elements that do not belong to the language are the answers, are the, the kind of instances that we should, we should answer no. Um, so one language we've seen, for example, is the, 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 the language of de deciding whether or not a graph is uh, Eulerian or Hamiltonian. So th that's a yes, no question. And some, some strings will codify, you can use to codify graphs that are, are Eulerian and others uh, which will not be. So now, the way you define hardness here is by defining complexity classes, which are collections of languages. One must see a complexity class as we are giving a computational device a finite amount of resources, typically time, but not necessarily. And we're asking ourselves, uh, so what can that particular computational device uh, achieve given that kind of resources. So again, this is an extremely, uh, extremely large uh, area of research in theoretical computer science. So I'm not going to go into, any, into uh, lots of details, but basically the most, the, 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 let's say the most famous classes you have, uh, P and P, P stands for polynomial time, And a language belongs to P if there exists a Turing machine M such that for all and the polynomial. So you need to have a Turing machine and a polynomial such that for all inputs, if input belongs to the language, then the machine accepts, enters an accepting state at some point in the computation when given it X as an input. If it does not belong to the language, then uh, the machine enters into the rejecting state and the computation always terminates in a, in a number of steps which is bounded by the polynomial of the length of the input rates given. More complicated problem typically require more time. If the time required by, by the, the, the language grows only polynomially, then this is, this is P. These are considered to be the easy problems. What are the examples of these problems? Well, the Eulerian cycle problem, as we said. Uh, two coloring of graphs. If I give you a graph and two different colors, and I ask you whether or not you can color the vertices of the graph, so that no adjacent vertices have the same color. This is 
super easy because you just start on one vertex and then alternatively change uh, na the neighboring you, you call it differently. There's a number of, uh, of problems in P. I'm not going to any specific, you know, uh, and P. Two polynomials. So the idea is that if the instance belongs to the language, then there exists, a, there exists a certificate that certifies its, the fact that it belongs so that the machine run on input, the instance itself and the certificate, can figure out that this is a correct certificate. So this actually belongs to the language. If it doesn't, then no certificate works. And the certificate need, needs to be polynomially large in the size of the, of, the, of the input of the instance. And also M has to terminate in time polynomial in the size of both of these things. So in particular, notice here that there is no claim made, even though this is, this is saying that certifying the, the fact that some, some instance belongs to the language is easy, there's no claim on how hard it is to find such a certificate. There's only, you're only saying that such, a, such a, a certificate must exist. So there's, a, there's a, all sorts of um, problems that belong to these uh, complexity classes. Is Hamiltonian cycle is one. There's uh, uh, satisfiability, which is uh, basically, suppose that I give you a formula in uh, Boolean logic, which is, I don't know, 
north x1 or x2 and x3 or x4, etc., etc. Is there an assignment of value, of truth values to, to these Boolean variables here that makes this formula true? Or, or, or if, if instead it is the case that any assignment of truth values will make this formula false. So deciding whether a formula is satisfiable or not is an NP uh, problem. This is uh, also true if you only s stick to KSAT, which is basically uh, this kind of proposi propositional logic uh, sentence in conjunctive normal form, meaning KSAT is given by a set of clauses, and each of the clauses is given by exactly k literals, and then you have various of these, and each literal is either some variable i or the negation of some variable i. And this is meant to be interpreted as all of all of these, so this clause here is true if at least one of these literals is, is, is true, and you're meant to take a conjunction of all the clauses in your, in, your, in, in your formula. So this is a case that we'll get back to soon enough. Notice all problems in P belong to, to this class here, because I can, just, I can just run the machine that decides the problem in polytime and forget about the, the certificate. Whatever certificate I'm given, I don't care about it. I decide the problem with the machine that it's supposed to solve it, and then I'm done with it. Now, for the benefit of time, because I want to move on to something juicier, I think I'm going to skip the part on well, NP completeness in particular. The idea is that P is a subset of NP, and this is well known. The question is, does the other direction hold? And uh, we don't know. This is a well-known open problem in computational complexity. The overwhelming majority of experts believe it does not. So P and NP are actually, there exist problems that intrinsically require more than polynomial many steps of computation to solve. But we don't have any proof of that. There's only uh, an overwhelmingly amount of attempts that have failed to provide uh, such, a, such efficient algorithms. But I think this is pretty much what I'm going to say for, uh, for computational complexity, because I only have 25 minutes left, and I want to move to something which brings us closer to the meat of the, of the of the, the reason why we, you, you guys are here. And uh, the idea is that this is the, this is the setup of uh, classical computational, com uh, classical computability and classical computational complexity. But we, we want more powerful computers. And the, let's say an empirical or maybe maybe not even empirical, uh, a pragmatic approach that people should take when building computers, as far as I can tell, is that if you see in nature, in the universe, you see some process that is doing some, so it's performing some interesting calculations, you want to provide it to your computer so it can harness its power, in a sense. And the first thing that people have figured out before going to uh, quantum mechanics was uh, randomness. So they figured out, and this, this is a, let me try this example. We go back to the 18th century, 
and uh, Georges-Louis Leclerc, uh, Le Comte du Buffon, who was a, a French aristocrat and scientist and a polymer, came up with, uh, in his elucubration, uh, came up with this nice experiment in probability theory. So you, you must imagine that you have a floorboard, you have a wooden floor with, uh, with these floorboards of, say, height B. And then you have uh, needles of length A. And you throw them at random on, on this floor. And uh, the question is, what is the probability that the needle will straddle two boards like this instead of being completely included in, in just one, such as this one here? And this problem is easy to solve if you use the correct coordinates. First of all, what we want to say, we want to constrain ourselves only in, since this is quite clearly a problem that repeats itself in this direction, so we will consider, we, to, we will describe the position of, of such, a, such, a, such a needle using two coordinates. One is the y is the distance between the lower end of the needle and the closest horizontal line above it. And the second one is the smallest counterclockwise angle between the horizontal direction and the direction of the needle. So we have two coordinates here. And a toss of, the, of, the, of a needle here is described by a pair y phi, where um, these two coordinates are sampled uniformly in b and 0 phi pi. So how do you solve this, this problem, even geometrically, if you want? Well, the probability of hitting, of uh, being in this case and not in this case, is proportional to an integral b dy integral d phi of a function that is the indicator function of having a hit. This function here is defined one if You must notice that this is the quantity A sin phi. If this quantity is uh, smaller than the other, then you have a hit. Otherwise, you are, uh, uh, you are in this situation. So, Graphically, this quantity here, yeah, zero otherwise. Graphically, are in this situation. This is the coordinate phi. This is the coordinate b. And this is a sin phi. This is the area that gives you the probability of hitting. 
So this double integral here is just the, the integral of this quantity of this function here. So you can see that the probability of hitting is just one over b pi, which gives the, the uh, proportionality constant, the, the norm, uh, normalization constant here. Integrating this from a sin phi d phi. This is an embarrassingly easy in integral, which you can compute to a pi b. And Buffon was fine, was happy with this, but then I think it was Laplace who came along saying, but actually, this gives us a way to estimate empirically the value of, of pi. Because you can set, for example, um, b equals 2a, and then you get 1 over pi. And then you could repeat this experiment here a bunch of times, and then the observed frequencies of number of hits divided by number of throws will converge to the probability of hitting in the limit of large number of throws. So the, the, the reciprocal ratio will converge to pi in that limit. And that is not obvious. It's not something immediately easy to do, specifically at the time where people didn't have a, a, an, an excellent way of uh, approximating pi. At the time, that was uh, something that people uh, found hard. And this is a, an empirical way of doing it. It's not, it's not a calculation. I, I would not be able to figure out right away how to define a Turing machine that does that. So one of the ways that I can have to, to actually enhance my Turing machine, my computational device, is to give it access to randomness so that then it can perform this kind of uh, experiment and approximate pi. So there's different ways of doing it. Um, again, uh, uh, I'm not really keen on, on deciding uh, how you want to do it, but the idea that the simplest way that you can imagine doing is that extending the, the concept of a Turing machine, having an, an additional register, and uh, like a random, And then uh, you can have a, a different transition function saying that at each step of the computation, the machine can ask the universe to generate a random bit here. And then the instruction will depend on the values of the tape and the content of the random bit. So based on the specific value that the universe generates, the machine will perform different things. And this makes the machine non-deterministic in the sense that different, different realizations of the computation will actually produce different results. And you ha now you have to study the, uh, the computation that the machine performs as a tree object. So this starts, and at some point of the computation, it, it asks for, for a, random, a random bit. And then now the computation splits. And let's say with probability one half, this becomes, this is a zero, and probability one half, this becomes a one. So now I have to follow the cases. And then maybe later on, this splits again. It requires a new, uh, a new uh, random um, uh, binary value. And this again splits uh, like one half here, one half here, et cetera. At the end of the day, even if all of these branches hold, so they, they actually give a, a, some value at the end, it does not, the machine does not give you uh, simply an answer. It provides you with an answer with a, the probability distribution. And also, if you were t thinking about accepting or rejecting a language, it, it, it no longer does that deterministically. It will accept or reject a language with some probability. 
And then you will have to define a different concept of uh, complexity classes, for example, saying, this is, I'm giving access to the randomness to my Turing machine. What are the languages that the Turing machine can accept with high probability? And that gives you, for example, uh, uh, BPP, which is bounded error probabilistic polynomial time. I'm not really going into any of those details because, uh, again, this is a, there are courses taught on, uh, on any of these topics, uh, if you're interested, there is uh, the entire courses on, on those. But I, I would like to move to something, to, to press on this, this idea here. And uh, I hope I lost the way out. And see a few other examples of what randomness can achieve. Yeah, okay, look, interesting, but it's, it's, a, it's a curiosity so far, because, okay, you can, you can approximate uh, pi. Nice, but is there anything more? The answer is yes, there's, there's, there's plenty more that you can do with randomness. And let's see a few things. The first thing I would like to discuss is uh, how to approximate KSAT instances. You remember, I just described quickly before, a KSAT is a particular form of, uh, of a propositional like Boolean logic uh, uh, formula. It's given by a number of clauses, let's say M clauses. And each clause is given by exactly k literals that you need to consider to imagine being connected by uh, this junction. So it's an O, L1, O, L2, O, L3, etc. And the different clauses are connected by conjunctions. So this formula needs to, to satisfy all of its clauses in order for it to be satisfied. So it's not immediately obvious if I were to give you a formula like, and sorry, and literals, I, re I remind you, are either a variable, say x1, or the negation of a variable. So you might know that the, the, there's SAT competitions out there. There's people who try to come up with the, the fastest algorithm to decide SAT, to decide, decide satisfiability. And every year there's something new, and every year there's some, some new algorithm that's faster from the previous one. So, and there's conferences uh, just on satisfiability. So one might say, well, well it looks like since this is an NP complete, so hard, one of the hardest problems in the, in, the, in the class NP, then you might say, look, look, it seems like a very hard problem to solve. It's hard to find, uh, uh, to decide whether uh, a formula is satisfiable or not. But surprisingly, randomized algorithms are quite po powerful in approximating uh, such, ch such formulas approximating in the sense of maybe I won't be able to find the, the, the assignment, the truth assignment that either satisfies it or satisfies the largest number of possible of clauses there, which would be the best uh, approximate, the best solution I have, but I can get close enough. If it's satisfiable, maybe I can't find the, the one that satisfies all of its M clauses, because that's NP complete, it's a, it's a mess. But I can satisfy a significant fraction of those clauses. And as it turns out, the, the, there's, uh, there's uh, let's, let's write this down as a theorem. Given. 
pre-SAT formula with M clauses, the expected number of clauses satisfied by a random assignment random meaning i just throw boolean values for these variables at at random with probability i flip coins and i assign oh what well, what's the value of this one zero with probability one half one with probability one half what about the x2? Same thing independently. Just purely blind. So the expected number of, of, of clauses is actually 7 8 over m. Oh, sorry, 7 8, 7 8 times m, which is 7 8 fraction. It's a surprisingly, surprisingly large fraction. So wh where does it come from? How, how can you do something like this? For each clause CJ, I define the variable Z, ZJ of, of X, where X is a, is a, a given uh, a truth assignment, to be 1 if X satisfies CJ 0 otherwise. And I define Z to be the sum of its ZJs. One to N. Now, the, expe the expectation of this, which is the expected number of satisfied clauses taken over, let's say, a probability, uniform probability of, over all possible uh, assignments of this random, random variable, by linearity, you can take the expectation inside, become J. This is due to its binary nature. This is equivalent to say, this is the probability that CJ is satisfied. And once you have one of these, this is easy to see, because if you see the disjunction here, this disjunction, this disjunction here is, uh, is false only if all of these literals are false. So you can, you can just check that provided you have uh, distinct literals, which is without loss of generality, you can assume that all the, the, the literals are, are disjunct, uh, disjunct. The, the, this one single uh, assignment of those three, of the, the, of the variables appearing in those, in those uh, uh, literals, which will falsify the clause. And this eight, two to the three for three sat, possible assignment. So this is just sum over j, 7, 8 equals 7, 8, m. And well, I see I have about five minutes uh, left. So uh, I will just say that. This is surprisingly large, but in particular, we have, we have proven that there exists at least one truth assignment that satisfies these many clauses. This is not obvious to begin with why this is the case, because 
it's a usual convex combination argument. The, an, an average value cannot be, uh, the, um, the, the, let's say, uh, random variables need to take values that are at least as large as its, at its average value sometimes. Because if all of the values you could take were below the, the average, then the average would be outside of the possible values that the, 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 the function, the, the particular uh, random, random variable would have. So this means that we have proven an exi existence statement purely through probabilistic arguments. This is a non-constructive proof, and this goes under the, the name of the probabilistic method. And uh, this is interesting by itself, but I want to move on and challenge you to the last, very, very last thing that I have. Probably, uh, as I was expecting, I'm, I, I can't, I, I'm not able to cover everything that uh, I had prepared in my notes. You will probably find some other, some more information about the, 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 the example of probabilistic algorithms uh, in uh, the notes that are going to be published and uh, made available online. But there's one last thing I wanted to introduce that would, should open the way to quantum mechanics. And the idea is that, okay, we've seen that randomness can be useful. And uh, there is a reason why I, I might want to, ha my com to give my computer access to randomness to increase the, the computational powers. Now, consider this experiment. This is a simplified version of an experiment that is actually done and was actually performed. And uh, suppose that you have a, a setup like this. You have a laser here. And here, here you have what, well, at the beginning of quantum physics, people would call the half-silvered mirror, but we describe as a beam splitter today. This is an actual mirror. This is again another mirror. And here you, are, you have detectors for your photons. These detectors are triggered if they are hit by, some, by a photon. So, the, if you were to do some, some tomography, some process tomography of these elements, then you would expect, suppose that my laser starts in, throws a photon that is traveling in this direction. And I will call, say, zero with this particular notation, the state of the system where the photon is going in this direction. You can see it, you can describe it as, as a vector like this. I'm going to only consider the possibilities that the photon either goes in the horizontal direction or the vertical direction due to the, the construction of this process. And then I have another one. That is the other one. Now, if you were to apply probability theory here, then, okay, how does the, the, the actual mirror behave? Well, the mirror flips this, a, a photon going in, say, this direction into this one, and a photon going in this direction into the other one. You should expect that if you want to describe that through some uh, um, stochastic matrix, it should, should be something like this should flip those states. This one here, instead, is a half-silvered mirror. What does that mean? It means that half of the times, the, the photon will pass through, and half of the times, it will be reflected. If I were to put something like this with, with detectors, photon detectors, and I shine the laser here, half of the times, this detector would go off, and half of the time, this detector would go off. So again, probabilistically, you would expect this to be described by one, 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 one half. So wherever it goes, half 
all the time is reflected up. Half of the time, it is it is a, it, the, the photon is, is transferred. So it's easy to see what you would expect to, to happen. You would expect that just by splitting the possibilities. I mean, here you have, you could go this way, this way. This has probability one half. Then again, this is a probability one half again. So this should give you uh, uh, one fourth. And the other is the same. This, uh, the, the, the path here has probability one fourth. The path like this has probability one fourth. There's four different paths that the system can take. They all have one fourth probability. At the end of the process, I should expect to this, this uh, detector here to go off half of the times, and this to go off half of the times. This is not at all what you see if you actually do the experiment. This one will go off 100% of the time. So what does that mean? And this is going to sound outrageous <laughs> for people who have not seen quantum mechanics before. The claim is that, my, the claim that I'm going to make here is that probability theory is wrong. This is just not the thing that we use to describe it. We should use a different kind of probability theory where you don't talk about probability. The states are not described by probability, by these probability vectors. They're described by something that is more fundamental, which is a probability amplitude. So your state is going to be alpha, beta, where alpha, beta are complex numbers, but if you haven't seen complex numbers, you might assume, it might, for this particular setup, it's fine to assume that these are real numbers. But the main point is that these can be negative. And the only requirement is that beta square should be normalized to one. And the, all this process here, I should be doing by studying what these devices are doing to the amplitudes. And once I arrive here, I should square the amplitudes of the state to get the probability of this one going off or this one going off. And soon enough, after Catherine's presentation, things will become much more uh, uh, easy to understand. The claim is that if you if you actually believe in quantum mechanics, what you, you would have is that this one should have a minus one here. And this is fine. And what happens is that the path that go like this and the path that goes like this have one half give you one half amplitude and minus one half. So when you sum them as before, before we were summing, we are saying this is one, one fourth probability and this is one fourth probability and they all get, get me here. So you should sum the probabilities. But now since you, have, you no longer have probabilities, you have probability amplitudes which can be negative, they can actually destructively interfere and give you probability zero at the end that you would not expect to see from probability theory, from classical probability theory. And this is a phenomenon which is purely quantum, and this is main, one of the main distinction between quantum mechanics, which is this kind of, if you haven't seen it, this kind of quirky version of probability theory, and classical probability theory. So here is an example of a process that I cannot explain using a naive interpretation, naive modelization through classical probability theory. Going back as before, these are the kind of process I want to make available to my computational device because I could extract something that classical randomness cannot give me. And uh, with this, I think I end my presentation here. Uh, this uh, was a hopefully uh, a nice uh, um, introduction to Catherine's lecture coming right away, I think.
and thank you for your attention, and I'm sorry if I, uh, uh, if it was a bit boring for some of you, but I think it was useful to get everyone on the same, on the same ground. Jutta. Thank you very much, Jenny. I recall uh, all of you that now we have a group photo that is going to take place just outside on the, uh, the, entrance, uh, the entrance of ICTP, not where you took the badge, but at the first, uh, no, actually, yeah, go where you took the badge, just outside, and uh, wait there and We'll make the photo before restarting for the next lecture.